We move to questions to the Minister of Justice. Uh, on that, question 10 has been withdrawn. I call. Uh... Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question 1. During the financial year 15 16, 60 members of prison operational staff retired on medical grounds. The breakdown is as follows one occupational support grade, four custody prison officers. 40 prison officers, including specialists, three uh, prisoner custody officers, and 12 senior officers. Mr. Hussey for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, previously, I had asked the Minister for details of prison officers who had retired as a result of an injury and duty, uh, and I have been informed that that information could not be provided uh, as that information was confidential. Could the Minister uh, advise me why that is confidential? And could the Minister assure this House that she will uh, take steps to find out how many uh, prison officers have been retired as a result of an injury on duty? Because clearly, as an employer, the employer should know that. Um, I, I thank the member for his response. Um, the, the reason that was uh, confidential is because uh, my department is uh, looking into a number of uh, correspondence issues that we had around injury on duty, so I am not at liberty to give any more information at this stage. Bradley. I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I uh, thank the Minister for her answer so far. I would, I would ask the Minister to recall on the 20th of September she answered in relation to a question on the Sean Lynch report that she had had a conversation about it. And I'd like to ask the Minister today can, can or did she, can she share with us, did she call and meet and discuss with the prisoner ombudsman or any of the senior management in the prison on that report? And if so, when does she expect the recommendations of the report to be implemented? I thank the member for her uh, supplementary. Um, indeed, um, we, we, we do accept the, the prisoner ombudsman's report around uh, for the particular uh, case regarding Sean Lynch. Um, I, I understand that the Northern Ireland Prison Service has given a commitment to, to look at those recommendations alongside the, the Southern um, Eastern uh, Trust in terms of putting those recommendations forward. Um, but yes, it is something um, in, in last question time I had alluded to around how we deal with prisoners who do have uh, severe mental health issues. And it's something um, I've spoke with um, about uh, with the management of the Northern Ireland Prison Service to see how we can better support uh, prison officers when there are prisoners who present themselves with really exceptional circumstances, as Mr. I call Edwin Pitt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Is it not a mark of shame in the prison service uh, that so many prison officers are being retired on medical grounds? And in terms of the duty of care um, of the prison service to their officers, is it appropriate that within a week of people coming out of hospital that they're being harassed and harangued about when they're getting back to work? whenever people actually have quite serious illness. I thank the, the member for his supplementary. And indeed, you know, I, I've said in the past that you know, working within uh, the prison service is an exceptional environment. Um, it really is like no other, other job prisons themselves you find are in um, quite isolated areas. So I, I think we need to be mindful of all of those things. Um, and indeed, you know, the, the, the member is right to suggest that you know, a high uh, level of our sickness absence is related to um, issues of anxiety, stress, depression, and other psychiatric illnesses. So I think moving forward, it's something that I am keen to look at so that I can better uh, support prison officers. And you know, I, I've reiterated it time and time again that you know, certainly in my uh, tenure as Justice Minister, I will look to see how I can better support prison officers, hopefully with the aim of reducing that sickness absence, because the, you know, the wider impact of that is that other officers are under pressure if there's not enough staff to, to be able to, uh, to carry out their duties. And even then, I suppose, to, to allude to the, the care of prisoners themselves, I, I think we need to be mindful of all those aspects. But I do think it starts with um, uh, training around prison officers and how we can better support them so that they can carry out their duties uh, to, to the standard that we expect. Iram Sir, Ian Mill. And I was weak as Fosta Donaira. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, can the Minister give us an assessment of the level of sick leave within the prison service and uh, how this is impacting on frontline services? Good. 
um, the, the recent uh, NISA report did um, identify that the, uh, there are significant levels of sickness, uh, sickness absence right throughout the Northern Ireland Civil Service, um, particularly within the, the Northern Ireland Prison Service, probably uh, the worst. Um, it represents an absence rate of about maybe 8.5%, um, which you know is, is still quite significantly high. And indeed, um, the measures that I've already outlined in terms of modernisation programme, looking at how we can better support prison officers in the job that they do on a day-to-day, -day, will hopefully try and address that sickness absence rate. Um, you know, Again, to reiterate, you know, working within a prison environment is, is really quite unique. It, it's like on no other environment. Um, a lot of the people that prison officers care for can be quite challenging in themselves, and it does uh, put a lot of strain and stress onto prison officers. But I think that's something that, in order to address, address sickness absence in itself, we have to look at how we can better support prison officers so that they do feel better equipped to do their jobs. We call Jim Allister. Does the Minister accept that the anxiety levels and the resulting consequences for pr prisoners are greatly accentuated by losses of control in the prison, such as we saw at the weekend, when in Coyle House, three prison officers were left to deal with 100 marauding prisoners on the landings, and the prisoner officers had to retreat to the circle. And meanwhile, there were fires in Urn House and in Bush House. Is the loss of control and the failure to keep control in the, in the prison not a big contributory factor to the huge dropout rate amongst prison officers. Thank the, the member for his uh, question and indeed how he presents the situation at the weekend um, as read in the, in the local press is certainly not the detailed report that I received. Yes, you know, I, I think we can acknowledge that there was a mechanical fault which did uh, lead to the opportunity of prisoners coming out of their cells, but in, in any one instance that was no more than 13 prisoners. And my understanding is, is that only six were ever, were ever on the you know, out in the prison at that stage. My understanding is that it was very much under control and um, what has been suggested in the press is, is not um, as has been detailed to me. Here I'm, sir, Alex Maskey. Call Alex Maskey for a question. For a <coughs> Can I ask the Minister um, for an update on any uh, response or communication from either the British Home Secretary or the Metropolitan Police in relation to the Pitchford inquiry and the undercover police? I wrote to the former Home Secretary on the 15th of June 2016 asking that the undercover policing inquiry be empowered to look at evidence relating to the undercover activities of English and Welsh officers in any jurisdiction where it is considering a case in England and Wales and the operative has subsequently crossed a jurisdictional boundary. I received a response on the 22nd of July which indicated that she had considered this proposal but had concluded that it was not possible to accommodate it within the inquiry's existing terms of reference. The letter also noted that the Home Secretary did not intend amending the terms of reference as this, was, as this would require further consultation and delay the progress of the inquiry. I have since made further representations to the new Home Secretary. The Metropolitan Police Service wrote to my officials on the 15th of June indicating that they were in the process of reviewing all of the material relating to the subject of the inquiry in order to progress current investigations and provide full and transparent disclosure. Alex Maskey for a supplementary. Sure, I can ask Cora, can I thank the Minister for that response. Can I ask the Minister, could you comment on the media reports about the Attorney General's apparent pledge that no one will face prosecution based on evidence given at the inquiry? And does that mean then that former officers will not be prosecuted for anything that they may disclose during the inquiry? I thank the member for his uh, supplementary. Um, as I'm sure the member will appreciate that these are matters between the Attorney General and the Chairman of the Inquiry. Um, however, it is a matter of record at the request of the Inquiry Chairman that the Attorney General has given an undertaking that individuals providing certain evidence to the undercover policing inquiry can do so without fear of prosecution. Here I'm sir, Alex Atwood. Call Alex Atwood. Uh, the Pittsburgh Inquiry deals with the activities of undercover officers. The, the Minister knows that there's a number of inquests that might touch upon the activities of undercover security personnel that are currently delayed in the High Court. Given that, is it not time for you as Justice Minister to advise the British Government that they should go ahead and release monies to enable inquests to be handled and managed by the Court Service in Northern Ireland, by the High Court judges in Northern Ireland, rather than wait and wait and wait for an executive decision in that matter that's not coming? <coughs> I, I thank uh, the member for his uh, supplementary and indeed you know as, as uh, the Minister of Justice of Northern Ireland I am a member of the Northern Ireland Executive. Indeed I am frustrated that we haven't yet secured funda funding in respect of the legacy inquest project that the Lord Chief Justice has uh, proposed. Um, 
but indeed it's something that I'm working on as Minister of Justice and along with my executive colleagues to see if that we can secure funding for legacy inquests. As I've told this House before, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, you know, I think time is not on our side when it comes to legacy inquests. Um, the people that um, we need to be working towards um, in terms of securing this uh, uh, project that the Lord Chief Justice has proposed is the victims of those families and time is not on their side. So yes, I can you know, give an assurance to the member that I am keen to try and uh, uh, work with my executive colleagues on that, but I can't do this alone. I'm a member of the Northern Ireland Executive and I'm quite keen to work so that we can start moving things. Thank you. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, can I ask, given the apparent involvement of police officers from England and Wales in undercover activities in Northern Ireland directly linked to the activities being investi investigated by the Pitchford Inquiry, will she continue to pursue this with the Home Secretary? I, I thank the, the member for her uh, question. Yes, I will continue to pursue this for the Home Secretary and indeed um, uh, before uh, question time I had um, written to the Home Secretary to, to again ask her to reconsider so she would extend the terms of reference to, to Northern Ireland where it's in, in terms of uh, cross-jurisdiction. So yes, it is something that I am keen to keep pursuing. I call Palm Cameron for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number three. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I uh, welcome the continuing interest in this matter, which is an area that I am already focused on. Um, as mentioned at last question time, we are in a post-conflict society and a lot of people, including prison officers, have been directly or indirectly affected by the trauma of the Troubles. And this, in, a, in many cases, has impacted on their men mental health, as I had spoke of earlier. As I also have uh, mentioned, a quarter of our prisoners themselves have mental health issues. So I am very conscious of the mental health issue affecting both prison officers and prisoners. There are a number of support mechanisms available to prison officers, and these include a dedicated staff welfare service, access to occupational health service, and a confidential counselling service provided by CareCall. These services are provided to staff to supplement the support and treatment available through the National Health Service. I'm keen to look at this issue and to focus on the support available to prison officers for the prison service to fulfill its aims in relation to the management and rehabilitation of offenders. I am clear that we must provide appropriate care and support for the staff carrying out this challenging work. And my officials continue to seek in improving the working environment and support services which are available to staff within uh, available uh, resourcing constraints. Um, Cameron for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer um, so far. And the Minister did, in response to the first question, she did um, mention that it's an exceptional environment that, that prison officers are working in. And given the challenging work environment and given the trauma experienced by prison officer staff on a daily basis, does the Minister consider six care call sessions to be um, sufficient provision? Um, to those suffering from conditions such as PTSD. I uh, thank the, the member for her question and indeed her continuing interest in, in this area. Um, in, in terms of the current provisions around supporting prison officers in relation to their own mental health and dealing with the, the pressures that they do face on a day-to-day, -day, I'm not quite sure that what we ha currently have in place is enough to support officers. Um, you know, I think um, one of the biggest legacies of our troubles, um, you know, right throughout Northern Ireland as well as within prisons, is the legacy of mental health. The troubles, you know, as I have said uh, at the outset, um, brought a lot of trauma to many people's lives and that has now resulted I think in mental health issues particularly amongst um, an older population an older population who themselves went through it and saw that trauma firsthand and I think now you know when they're getting to an older age when they're perhaps even retiring these are manifest manifesting as mental health problems so no I, I think um, in this new environment and moving forward, I am really keen, as I have, I have reiterated time and time again to this House, that prison officers do need to be supported, and we do need to be mindful of, their, of how they are dealing with uh, the, the very challenging circumstances that they are faced with day and day on their job. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, I welcome this discussion on prison service staff. I'd like to just declare uh, two interests. One, that I did indeed work for the prison service for four years, so I'm talking from a practitioner's perspective and also a position of mental health. Um, and we've talked about care call and the provision of the six uh, calls that the staff would be entitled to. Uh, I, for one, can uh, certainly verify that it is a unique job, and I welcome what you've said, and certainly in terms of support. It is a very, very unique experience to work in any of the, the prisons that we had here. 
However, whilst Kirkhall is a very good service, and, and I'm not taken away from them, would you uh, agree that perhaps there is the need for something more specific to the needs of prison officers and their mental health? And do you have any plans to develop uh, any such system? I, uh, I thank the member for his question. Indeed, I welcome him to the House. I think this is the opportunity that we've had to engage on, on the floor. Um, I, yes, I, I think it, you know, there is an opportunity now to look at this um, in a much more holistic way. Indeed, I have instructed my officials to, to, to look at how we can better support prison officers because, as I said, you know, in response to question one and indeed to uh, Mrs Cameron's um, question, I think we will um, encourage better rehabilitation and better care of prisoners if we can at first start with prison officers themselves. They will be much better equipped to be able to do the job that they do. But again, equally, they need to be considered in terms of the support around them. So, yeah, I, I have, you know, um, to answer your question, and I have already instructed my officials to look at this and see how we can better do it. We're talking about a potential modernisation programme, which not, all, which not only look at, looks at their, um, uh, the, the issues around their mental health, but looks at their family life. It looks at the opportunities in terms of shift working and how that, they can best manage that so that they can have that proper work-life balance, which I think is also very important when we're looking at mental health issues. So it is something that I am quite, quite keen to address. Um, I also uh, visited High Bank Wood uh, with the Health Minister uh, last week, and I think that demonstrates our commitment to work together on these issues, which I know was one of her priorities as well. So, you know, I, I think positively moving forward, we are keen to tackle it. So um, we'll, we'll see how we can move. But I, I would welcome any members' input of this House on how they feel that we can best do that, because um, after all, we are all in this together. So. Chair Mark Durkin. Kermay, I would ask Sean Coolia to thank the Minister for her answers thus far. I'd just like to maybe ask the Minister what precise mechanisms have been put in place by the Department and indeed in the Department to ensure that prisoner ombudsman recommendations arising from the Sean Lynch report are implemented faithfully and in full. I, uh, th I thank the Member for his question. Um, at this stage, um, the, uh, since the, the, the report was um, published quite recently, the, my department, indeed, alongside with officials from the health, will, will take time to consider the recommendations. But indeed, you know, as I've said to, uh, in answer to previous questions, we, we do accept the report and we do accept that there needs to be lessons learned from you know, this very, very tragic case. And um, we will look carefully at those recommendations to see how we can best implement them. Um, it is something that, that we do need to take the, the proper time and consideration of because you know, the, the outcome you know, was was very, very tragic. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what specific action she has taken since her appointment to improve the health and wellbeing services that are available to prison officers given the urgent, uh, bespoke and acute needs that they face? I thank uh, the member for his question. Indeed, at this stage, uh, you know, into my uh, ministerial role, you know, I, I'm very much about listening. Um, I, I come to this house not as someone bringing my own baggage or bringing my ideas that I've plucked out of thin air. I'm very much keen to listen to stakeholders on the ground so that they can best advise and um, put forward the ideas that they think best represent them. So certainly at this stage, um, I, I'm very keen to, to uh, listen to um, views from prison service through the representation of the Prison Officers Association and anyone else who wants to uh, uh, put forward their views. I'd like the representatives as well have a role in that. Um, and I, I think certainly if there are concerns around uh, the welfare of prison officers, and indeed prisoners too, um, I'd be really keen to hear that from a number of members, and indeed a lot of members have been forthcoming in doing so. So I think right now it's very much about a listening exercise, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, um, because I do want to ensure that I get this right, um, and I can't do that by plucking ideas out of my own mind. I have to listen to the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, Aim, sir, Declan Kearney. Just to, to advise members, before, that if members wish to ask a question to continue standing, please. Otherwise, I have no way of knowing whether the, the question has already been answered or not. Michael asked him to ask 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 him to Minister, would you agree with me that all prison staff, uh, all prisoners, both on the integrated and the segregated wings, uh, families of prisoners and visitors to the uh, prisons, deserve to be treated with uh, dignity and respect, and that those principles and adherence to those principles are at the very foundation of ensuring that we have a prison system uh, which is bereft of stress and 
creates the best conditions whereby we can in fact ensure that appropriate interventions are made to address uh, prisoners who are suffering with uh, mental illness and, uh, and, and mental conditions. I thank the, the member for his question. And yes, of course, you know, uh, um, I, I believe that all uh, people, you know, whether it's prisoners, whether it's prison officers, uh, prisoners' families, people that are engaging within the prison environment are treated with dignity and respect. Um, I, I suppose. Um, from my perspective, that judgment was made in the courts in terms of them coming into that prison environment. You know, so certainly the role of coming into prison is to better rehabilitate and uh, to, to provide care for people with the, within uh, the, the prison environment. So yes, you know, I, I do agree with the comments that the member has made, and, and I think it's it's a good uh, uh, fundamental basis that we need to, uh, when, we're, when we're thinking about how we do move forward in better caring for prisoners and prison officers. I call William Humphrey for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. <clears throat> There is a significant uh, body of evidence from Northern Ireland and worldwide which demonstrates the benefits of restorative uh, practices within a criminal justice context, and community-based restorative justice plays an important role in this. Since the government protocol was agreed in 2007, the two accredited community-based restorative justice schemes in Northern Ireland have made positive contributions to keeping their communities safe, repairing relationships, and helping to reduce the harm caused by antisocial behaviour and offending. They are also key partners for statutory justice organisations, including the probation service and the police. Without their expertise and community presence, many of our criminal justice disposals would lack this restorative element and would be poorer for it. This positive work was recognised by the Fresh Start panel report on tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime. They consequently made a number of recommendations which involved the accredited community-based restorative justice groups in their delivery, all of which have been accepted in the Executive Action Plan and which my officials will be working with them to implement. In addition, representatives, representatives from both accredited groups are helping to inform the drafting of an overarching adult restorative justice strategy, which my department is leading on and which will be published for consultation in 2017. Mr. Humphrey, for uh, thank you very much, and I thank the minister for her answer so far. Minister, can I ask you if you believe that the, the two restorative justice organisations that you have mentioned, although by, not by name in your answer, are making a difference, and can there be stronger linkages between those organisations and the police? Uh, yes, indeed. I, you know, I, I think um, restorative justice is, is almost quite a controversial uh, practice, and you know, at the outset, it you know did uh, receive an awful lot of criticism. But I think it has proved both here and across the world that restorative justice is actually an important element of our criminal justice system in terms of connecting with communities and trying to get to the heart of the problems of why people com commit uh, offences and commit crimes. Um, in terms of uh, working with the PSN, I understand that there is good working relationships with those uh, community-based uh, restorative uh, justice. Justice groups, and um, but indeed, you know, if we need to look at that to strengthen it, I'd be, you know, I'd be very keen to hear the, the members' comments, uh, you know, on another occasion as to how he feels we can best do that. Irm Sir Colin McGrath, call Colin McGrath. Thank you. Uh, can the minister explain why, at present, Mr. Deputy Speaker, she intends to bring forward uh, no new primary legislation before June 2017, which will be one full year after the start of the mandate? Um, I, I thank the, the member for his question. It's got nothing to do with the question that was asked by Mr. Humphrey. Um, but no, indeed, um, I'm at a stage where I'm certainly looking at uh, my uh, priorities for the next five years moving forward. Um, there's a number of areas that I have identified, including domestic violence, mental health, children and young people, uh, women, and looking at crimes against older people in particular. Um, I will very much uh, weave them into to the, the responsibilities that my department has as, as a whole. Um, and I actually think it's a really exciting five years that, you know, um, the last mandate, in my opinion, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, was very much about uh, transition, and I think right now we're going to transform. This will be the mandate of delivery, and I'm keen to see it through. Just to remind members that supplementary sh should relate to the question originally. Of course, it's at the Minister's discretion whether she chooses to answer or not, and she did on that occasion with a plum. So, um, Nesbitt. Question five, please. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will take questions five and nine together. 
Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, animal cruelty really is a disgusting crime and I fully recognise the member's concern um, and I appreciate that both members um, uh, of, two, of, of questions number five and number nine have taken the opportunities to raise the debate both in and out of this House. Sentencing in individual cases is a matter for the independent judiciary who must take account of the relevant facts and circumstances of any case. The limited nature of my department's role in animal welfare issues is to ensure that a suitable legal framework exists which provides court with appropriate powers to deal with all cases of animal cruelty. This includes ensuring that the maximum penalties available to the courts were appropriate. Following the joint review into the implementation of the Welfare of uh, Animals Act 2011, undertaken by the former Department of Agriculture and Rural Development and my department, legislation was brought forward in the Justice Act 2016, which increased maximum penalties for animal welfare crime. The relevant provisions were commenced on 1 August this year. In addition to increasing the maximum penalties available, my department also provided additional powers to the Director of Public Prosecutions to allow him to refer animal cruelty cases to the Court of Appeal if he considers that the sentence handed down in certain Crown Court cases is unduly lenient. These changes provided Northern Ireland with amongst the toughest maximum penalties for animal cruelty of any jurisdiction on these islands. As I said, decisions on the appropriate sentence are entirely a matter for the independent judiciary. In making these decisions, judges are guided by guideline judgments from the Court of Appeal and sentencing guide guidance. And I understand that the Judicial Studies Board, the, the body responsible for judici uh, judicial training, is to receive briefing from DERA and local councils on animal welfare issues. Um, turning to the number of prosecutions, in 2015 there were 78 cases of animal cruelty disposed at the courts in Northern Ireland, 48 of which resulted in a conviction. In 2016, there have been 44 prosecutions disposed of at court, 32 of which resulted in a conviction. There have as yet been no, uh, no prosecutions under the, the new provisions. Call Mike Nesbitt for supplementary. And I thank the Minister uh, for, for her answers. Would she agree with me that the need at the moment is not for new laws, but for a more rigorous application of the existing laws? Uh, would she welcome the assurance I received from the Director of Public Prosecutions last week that he stands ready and willing to exercise his new powers uh, to refer uh, unduly lenient uh, sentencing to the Supreme Court and also that we should have zero tolerance of anybody convicted of animal cruelty walking free from court, laughing and jeering at the PSNI and animal lovers. I uh, thank the, the member for his comments. Yes, entirely. I think we should have zero, zero tolerance. Um, and I think the member is right to suggest that the, the current legal framework that we have in place, particularly uh, the new framework in, in place from the 1st of August this year, is certainly robust enough. But however, how that is applied within the courts is a matter for the independent judiciary. Um, but I, I am uh, pleased to hear that uh, the member had met with the, the Director of Public Prosecutions, who has given a commitment to, to try and ensure that if, if sentences are unduly uh, lenient, there will be an opportunity to address those. I call Emma Little-Pengelly. I thank the Minister for her response. The, the Minister will be aware of the Kirkwood family, which I think that my colleague has uh, referenced already, in my constituency of South Belfast, who, despite carrying out what the judiciary called one of the vilest examples of premeditated abuse, uh, got a suspended sentence on an animal ban. Just two weeks ago, that family were caught having animals despite of that ban, which, in my view, re-emphasised the need for the likes of a register. Would the minister commit to meet with me in relation to this issue? And it has progressed in terms of the private members' bill I'm intending to bring forward on this. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Speaker. And yes, indeed, you know, I, I'm more than happy to meet with uh, Mrs. Little Pengelly around this issue. And indeed, I acknowledge uh, the opportunity she's taken within this House to raise this issue. Um, it is disappointing that, um, you know, the, on the case that she particularly um, outlines to. Again, um, in terms of the current legal framework, it will be up to the independent judiciary in, in regards to individual circumstances. But, you know, I, I do think um, the purpose of this House is to raise debate on issues like this and to read the, 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 the public uh, feeling around this particular issue you know and as Mr Nesbitt has also alluded to you know there needs to be zero tolerance on you know people who deliberately uh, uh, commit animal cruelty offences so you know if it's something that we do need to look at even in terms of the legal framework of which I'm responsible for then I'm quite happy to see if we can do that thank you Iram Fair Linda Dillon the review of implementation on the Animal Welfare Legislation Report made 68 recommendations, and whilst I accept 68 is quite a number, could the Minister maybe give us an, an update or an overview on how many of those have been implemented in full? 
I, uh, I thank uh, the member for her question. Um, at this stage, I don't have that information to hand, but I am quite happy to, to write to, to the member and outline uh, where we are in terms of that implementation of those, those recommendations. But you know, I, I, I will follow that up in due course. Time is up, and we now move to topical questions to the Minister for Justice. I call Sandra Overend for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the situation at Mugabe Prison at the weekend when 100 prisoner, prisoners were accidentally released simultaneously onto landings with only three prison officers um, who were placed in great danger as a result? Um, I, as I had uh, uh, said to uh, Mr. Alistair in a previous answer, um, I have received a detailed account of the incident um, at Coyle House at the weekend uh, within McGarbury. Um, it, it is right to say that a technical fault had lasted for 50 minutes, um, which meant that um, uh, prisoners were not uh, contained within their cells. Um, I, it's, as was recently reported in media, um, I, I understand that prisoners not, did not run riot throughout um, uh, the prison service. Um, and that, uh, that this certainly was uh, contained, as I had said to uh, Mr. Alistair earlier. Um, it, it was a rolling um, a mechanical fault, which meant that only 13 prisoners had the opportunity to be out of their cells at any one time. I understand the most um, that were out of their cells at that point was six. So, um, and certainly whilst the fault in itself is regrettable, these things do happen. Um, and I appreciate that there is a nervousness around, you know, um, of what could have happened, but it's certainly something that we will take away and we will learn from um, and see how we can prevent anything like happening uh, in the future. Sandra Overend for a supplementary. Thank you, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that response. Um, one quote uh, from a prison officer, and I'm sure will touch the Minister as it touched me. Um, they said, nobody wants to highlight the risk and how vulnerable we are. Uh, will the Minister commit to talking directly to prison officers uh, on this particular issue to find out the dangers, their needs, and whether the staffing levels are inadequate, as my colleague uh, Doug Beatty previously mentioned to the Minister? Um, I am indeed very, very mindful um, of the, the, the vulnerability that prison officers can feel in, in a challenging, you know, an often dangerous environment, you know, w within our uh, prisons uh, across Northern Ireland as well as in uh, uh, Mugabe itself. Um, I, I have met with uh, representatives of prison officers through the Prison Officers Association um, uh, through the, the Northern Ireland Civil Service Handbook. It would prevent me from directly meeting with prison officers themselves. But indeed, you know, it's, I, I, I certainly encourage that if there are issues, particularly from elected representatives in this House, um, from their understanding of the issues that prison officers face, that I would be more than happy to meet so I can better understand so that we can actually find a way of how we address them issues. Jim Allister for a question. Okay. Would the Minister like to take the opportunity to condemn those Sinn Féin members of this House who recently gave succour to convicted terrorists by their visit to Mugabe Prison, when amongst those they had visited were the murderers of Constable Carroll? And does she accept that such visits and the accompanying utterances are then ready-made propaganda for the terrorists who are at war? with this province. I, I thank the, the member for his question. And indeed, um, any elected representative is entitled to, to visit uh, prisoners within, uh, who, who are within custody. Um, however, I will say that we do need to be mindful of the, the public message and, our, and around the victims in terms of uh, any sort of uh, public um, message around this. So um, I, I would remind all uh, members of this House in terms of the messages that they put out um, to be very mindful of the, the people that it, it also um, is uh, it involves. Mr. Alistair for a supplement. In terms of messages, has the Minister any comment on the fact that recently an individual with a previous terrorist history who was convicted of possession of a submachine gun with intent to endanger life, the most serious offence of possession of which you can be convicted, was gifted a mere four and a half years in prison. Does that not suggest a message that we're only half-hearted in fighting terrorism? 
I thank uh, the member for his question. And no, I don't think we're half-hearted in fighting terrorism. Northern Ireland has come an awful long way in terms of our troubled past, and indeed there will be certain uh, elements of our troubled past that we do need to address head-on, or we're never going to address at all. You know, it would be a, a huge failure, I think, on this executive, indeed in every member of this House, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, if, if we do not those dresses, because I do think there needs to be some sort of truth element in terms of our post-conflict society, which we now find ourselves within. So, you know, I, I, I don't underestimate the challenge that that will be, but I do think that we, do, we need to be brave because we represent the people of Northern Ireland, and I appreciate that there's a lot of people hurting throughout Northern Ireland, but it's our job to see if we can find the best way moving forward, and that won't always be the easiest way, but I think it's something that we have to commit to for the, for the, for the best interests of everyone that we represent right across uh, Northern Ireland. Here, sir, Nicola Mallon for your case. I call Nicola Mallon for a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, is the Minister aware, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that in the absence of a specialist unit for children and young people suffering acute mental health and addiction uh, issues, that very often they end up in custody suites for their own safety, if not in a and &E, sitting with police officers for hours on end? Does the Minister think, firstly, that this is in the best interest of those vulnerable children and young people, and secondly, that it is a good use of PSNI officer time? Um, I, I completely understand what the member is, is alluding to, and I'm not quite sure it is. Um, I think um, one of the biggest tragedies of uh, the justice system is that it's almost the failure department when every other part of our public services has already failed. And I think in order to try and tackle that, we need to look at more upstream approaches so that they don't actually get to finding themselves within custody. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm finding that a lot of, people who a lot of young people who come uh, in custody do have some sort of mental health problem, some sort of addiction problem um, and that usually results from some sort of trauma earlier in life um, so do I think the best place for them is custody I'm not quite sure um, but I suppose the difficulty around that is is that if they're not in custody where else can they go and certainly um, I've committed to working alongside the health minister to see if there is a way that we can address this because I don't think you know when we put people into custody it actually helps their situation particularly young people if anything they're probably at the beginning of a downward spiral and that's not good enough I think we need to look um, at the, the best needs of our children and indeed for a safer community and safer society. I don't want these people when they're now finished in custody going back to the starting block of where they began that find themselves within custody. So we do need to look at more upstream approaches and indeed uh, what the members are alluding to, it's something that the Health Minister and I have been discussing. Um, thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and, and can I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, as she has alluded to, given the overlap between mental health and addiction issues and youth justice and the criminal justice uh, system, could I ask that the Minister raises the issue of the need for a specialist treatment unit for children and young people with addiction and mental health issues when she is discussing a range of issues with the Health Minister? Yeah, indeed, I, I'm quite happy to discuss a number of issues, and if um, the member herself you know, would be keen in sort of joining any of those discussions, I'd be quite keen to hear her views, because I do think it's something that we need to address. You know, I find almost that the criminal justice system is a vicious cycle that begins with trauma in the home, which then uh, uh, manifests itself into addiction or, or mental health issues, which is why domestic violence is one of my overarching priorities, because we see uh, the manifestations of that and, and the issues that we've been talking about. So I, I think we, we do need to look at this on a, a much... Uh, a wider holistic kind of approach. It shouldn't be the case of uh, satisfying uh, criminal justice outcomes. It should be actually looking where we're getting to that place in the, in the first instance. Here, I'm sorry, Karen Nicolin, for when you guys to call uh, Karen Nicolin for Gormier, a question. I'll get to last call you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, my question almost follows on from Nicola Mullins, and it's really in relation to the care policies and procedures and the training that uh, present staff would have in relation to looking after anyone in custody, particularly with mental health needs and complex mental health needs. Just to ask the Minister what her view on that is. <clears throat> Yeah, um, as I outlined, that you know, we find, I think um, up to half of my prison popula population do present with uh, mental health issues. So, you know, there is an issue around the care that we provide them when they are uh, within uh, uh, custody. Um, and certainly, you know, as I've alluded to, to a number of uh, questions today, um, I think we can better look at how we can look after prisons when, when they're within our establishments by looking at the training uh, the prison officers themselves have and how they, how they can better deal with uh, prisoners with mental health issues. But again, I think that starts with the prison officers themselves in terms of their own mental health issues. It can't be just uh, looking at each issue in isolation. I think in terms of moving forward with our, uh, with our prisons, um, I'm keen to, to ensure that 
we can have a, 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 a service, I suppose, or a system that's, that's fit for purpose, and that comes from both the perspective of looking after prisoners within our custody, but also the prison officers themselves. Well, Carolyn Killen for a supplementary. I, th I thank the Minister for her response, and, but there are issues that people with mental health problems end up in prison, and what they need is treatment and support. Um, and I know that's an issue for the criminal justice system at the other end. But while the people are in custody, I'm not convinced that there's enough training and awareness to uh, prison staff around mental health needs. And I would encourage the Minister, as well as Minister for Health, or anyone else, uh, to ensure that that's the case. Because in many instances, people end up in this conveyor belt. They're often in prison. And what they get is a custodial sentence, and what they really need is treatment. And I'm not convinced that the awarenesses are in the first place to even recognise that they need treatment in the first place. Iram, sir, Conor Murphy, when you cast, I call Conor Murphy. Sorry, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no, no, you're, you're fine, David Swigger. Um, yes, no, I, I, I do agree, and indeed um, the working relationship that I have with the Health Minister and the conversations that we've had in the recent months have very much uh, centred around um, the, the very issue that you're talking about. How can we better uh, uh, provide health care, both within prisons, but also in terms of the people actually coming into prison? Is prison the right environment for them? I'm not quite sure, but there does have to be a balance in terms of community safety and in terms of uh, the public perception of what prisons are for, but you know, ultimately rehabilitation because you know I, I do think you're very much right to point out that this is a conveyor belt you know an almost a vicious circle that can you know that almost begins with that offense and then a spiral because of them finding themselves within custody I suppose one of the sad um, things that we find that a lot of uh, offenders who find themselves within custody actually get onto a path where their, their lives um, are, are quite organized they are on the right medication they are receiving a certain amount of support but the difficulty is what happens when they come out of custody. They go back to square one because those support mechanisms are not in place. So it has to be both an approach that we look at why people are finding themselves within custody whilst they are in custody and then the process that happens when they come out of custody so that we can actually stop at a point so that a circle doesn't keep going round and round. Aram, sir, Conor Murphy, for when you cashed Conor Murphy, Conor Murphy. Conor Murphy. Uh, I've, I've listened to the, the Minister's uh, responses to date, and clearly she is exercised about the duty of care that there is to prisoners in custody. And in, in relation to the, the tragic case of Patrick Kelly from Ober, the police, uh, the, the prison ombudsman report has found that his death should have been pre prevented. Uh, is the Minister, uh, with all of the discussions she's had to date, satisfied that such an event wouldn't happen again? Um, I, I suppose I, I can't really answer that, to be quite honest, because um, I, I, in, in terms of the prisoner ombudsman's report that we have received of late, of late, and there have been a number, there are lessons to be learned, there are recommendations that need to be put in place. I would certainly hope that wouldn't be the case, and indeed my sympathies extend to everybody involved in these tragic uh, circumstances and indeed their families. Um, but you know, I, I think moving forward we have to have a robust system to ensure that it doesn't take place. Um, and, and I think that starts with looking at the recommendations that the, the prisoner ombudsman himself has put forward, but also wider issues that I've discussed at length in this chamber today. Um, it, it's, it, we can't look at these issues in isolation of one another. If prison officers are going to better care for prisoners, they need to be supported as well, so, which is why I'm always keen to package the two together, because I do think it's, it's, it's an important um, uh, area of work. And to, to stop you know, families losing people, it, it, it's, it's not good enough, and, I, and I, it is something that I'm keen to address, along with the health minister who's just joined us in the chamber. So. Conor Murphy for a supplement. I uh, thank the Minister uh, for her response. And I, I, I listen to what she's saying, but of course there is a duty of care to the prisoner from the prison authorities themselves. And uh, while I, I welcome and appreciate a conversation she may have with the Minister for Health in this regard, the Southern Trust also have a role in relation to this. And can she ensure uh, that they will play their role in making sure that there are no further instances like this in, in prison? Um, I, I don't like to speak on behalf of the health minister who is sitting in this chamber, but indeed, you know, we have met on a number of occasions recently, and I think um, it's fair to say that we have both committed that we, we are looking at, at the, the, this particular in issue in terms of health care within prisoners and prisoners too. Because while she rightly alluded that we do have a, a duty of care towards prisoners, we do have a duty of care towards prison officers. So I, I am keen to address this in a very much parallel approach because I think we will be all better impacted um, and, and we will see the benefit of it. Take a quick question. Call Morris Bradley. Speaker, can I ask the Minister uh, for her views on the recent drugs amnesty at McGabry Prison? What prompted this amnesty 
and what drugs, if any, were handed in. I, I, I thank the member for his um, uh, question. Um, I think anyone who takes um, illicit substances does put themselves at risk. Um, I don't think it's any secret um, that you know, drugs are a problem within prisons as well as outside of prisons. It's a problem that we will continue to, uh, to face day on day. Governors um, will use a number of tools at their disposal to try and keep prisoners safe, and this can include a, an amnesty which will you know, protect life so that we can perhaps take these drugs out of circulation. Um, the, government, uh, the governor sorry, at Mugabe used um, this limited amnesty for those reasons because there was a concern around particular drugs that you know, have had harm on prisoners. Um, in terms of that amnesty, I, I think it's, it's rather than even, I suppose, it almost had a dual purpose, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and that it was about taking drugs out of circulation, but I think it was also to raise awareness with the prisoners themselves that these drugs are dangerous. And when a governor takes an approach like this, it really does suggest and highlight how dangerous these drugs are. And um, if, if they want to uh, ensure their, sort of their own well-being, it, it needs to be raised with them, you know, as well as trying to actually take them out of our prisons. Time's up. If members just take their ease, please, while the Speaker takes the chair.